now officially halfway through the year, which means it's time for the top 10 movies of 2023 so far. Ooh, get ready. I'm excited to hear your own thoughts and lists down below. And the rules are that any movie that was seen before June 30th counts. And because I saw Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning in a press screening before June 30th, it's not only on my list, but it's number one. I was gonna say that, you know, I would just wait because it technically doesn't come out until after halfway through the year, but it's my number one movie. So I, I, I mean, I had to put it in there because it's the best movie I've seen so far. Uh, so yeah, by the way, you might be like, what, why are we going from best to worst? I know a lot of you prefer to go from worst to best, but I have a feeling that some of you aren't gonna like the movies at the bottom of my top 10. Uh, here's a hint, poor Disney, they just can't catch a break these days. So it'll be a different kind of suspense. Uh, but wow, Tom Cruise sure is on a roll, and he keeps topping himself, unbelievably. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning is a thrill ride that combines Christopher Nolan's style with Alfred Hitchcock's, which, which makes me very happy. I particularly love Alfred Hitchcock, as many of you know. So anytime anyone can even get close to that, I'm thrilled. Uh, this movie features some of the best action sequences I've ever seen, forget this year. It's hilarious and absolutely gorgeous to look at. Uh, plus it features a number of actors who I just really adore uh, spending time with and I'm so happy to see them level up in this franchise. It's not a perfect movie and you can check out my non-spoiler review, which is currently up, to learn a few places that I think it misses the mark and we'll discuss it even more when my spoiler review drops next week. But so far, yeah best movie of the year, but it is close. Uh, you know, usually you would say not even close, but yeah, there's a very close runner up. And in fact, because most of you haven't seen Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, I bet it's your number one. And that's Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, another franchise that keeps upping its game from installment to installment. Unbelievably so, you can't think, you think you can't get better than the last entry, but yet here we are. Now, I have loved Miles Morales since I read his debut comic. A fabulous character. I get annoyed when people say he's not an original character. He is. He's incredible. And it's thrilling to see him not only realized on the big screen, but to grow even more as a character. Uh, they not only did a good job, but they've improved the character. Oh, it's amazing. He feels so authentic and real. And it's also a fun and exciting character as well, just like you would want from any superhero. Plus, the animation in this movie is nuts. Like, wow, the first one was good, but this, this movie belongs in a museum of modern art. Uh, and as animation catches on with adults in the West, in large part thanks to this franchise, it's so exciting to see experimentation in the medium and boundaries not just pushed, but broken. And it has a great story. That cliffhanger uh, ending was incredible. I can't wait for part two. All right, number three, Blackberry. I told you this was a good movie. Look how high up it is on my list. And I hope that I will inspire even more of you to check it out. I watched this movie myself because of word of mouth. I saw a lot of people on Twitter vouching for it. And I was like, mm, all right, I had nothing to watch. I was like, I'll check it out. And also, I always enjoyed Jay Baruchel's work. I was like, I love that guy. How bad can it be? However, by the time the movie was done, I found myself a huge Glenn Howerton fan. I get it. I finally understand what so many of you are talking, well, actually not a lot of you, but you're I, some people are talking about Glenn Howerton and now I'm one of them. He might be from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, but he can also do drama. I mean, he's funny here for sure, but he's also, it seems, just a great actor. Blackberry is the true, unbelievable story of the hottest phone out there until the launch of the iPhone. Uh, Howerton's Jim Balsley uh, understands business, uh, not only a lost art to many, but one that isn't even respected these days. But then, of course, Balsley goes too far. Like, that's the thing. Like, you gotta be careful. Often, I think one of the reasons the, business, the art of business gets a bad rap is because people often go too far. But there, you need to just walk that fine line. And on that note, Baruchel's Michael Lazaridis is a tech genius, but he's also an idealist who just can't, well, he, I think he even won't understand how business works to his detriment. Amazing movie, so much to learn from it. All right, number four, Air, another business movie. You know I like business. 
Uh, and Ben Affleck's return to form as an auteur director after his DC misadventure. Uh, like BlackBerry, Air does a deep dive on a product that not just was everywhere, um, Air Jordans are still everywhere to this day, but a product that changed its very industry. But while BlackBerry is a cautionary tale, Air is more upbeat and inspirational, probably because the Air Jordan is still around and still dominating. Uh, while the movie is about the sneaker that Michael Jordan made famous, the focus is instead on his mother Dolores, played by Viola Davis, who Michael Jordan himself wanted to play his mom. Isn't that sweet? That's so great. Uh, great choice, Michael Jordan, obviously, but it worked out great. And his mother secured, it was his mother who secured the most lucrative sneaker deal ever for an athlete. And she is the one who changed the industry because she knew her son's worth and she wasn't afraid to demand that it be recognized. Great story. The film is also, it's also very funny uh, and anchored by a great performance by Matt Damon with a very strong assist from Chris Messina as a foul-mouthed sports agent. Those conversations were fantastic. All right, number five, Extraction 2. Now, normally I wouldn't include a streaming movie on this list, but Extraction 2 is so good, and this year, kind of light on great movies, that I decided to include it. In fact, I put this movie on my list instead of John Wick 4, which might be blasphemous to some of you, but that's how I feel. It's my list. Uh, I love the third act of John Wick 4. I did. All the stuff in Paris is phenomenal. But I felt the movie was a bloated version of what the franchise once was and lost the emotional thread that had made it special. To me, John Wick 4 has some stunning action sequences for sure. But again, as a movie as a whole, it's really driving in circles. And I hated that ending, boy. Especially because it looks like they're not even going to have the guts to keep it. Extraction 2 is still early in its franchise and keeps things simple. Like the title says, Tyler Rake's job is to get someone out of a bad and dangerous situation, to extract them. It's a great, simple setup that I think can last for a very long time. Plus, Joe Russo, who writes these movies, is always careful to give each mission a small emotional element, just enough to work, but to, again, to still keep it simple. Sam Hargrave and Chris Hemsworth have really stepped up here with a 20 minute long take, uh, an action long take in the middle of the film that needs to be seen to be believed. Ah, oh, you gotta see it, it's so incredible. All right, number six, The Flash. I liked it, I liked it. As a DC fan who has put the drama behind them, and I, I think this movie to some degree also helped me to be able to do that even more, I just enjoyed that it was a celebration of DC. I thought the CGI cameos were fun. I thought Ezra Miller was funny and charming. I thought the action sequences were thrilling. To me, it was a really fun time at the movies. Now I can appreciate and respect that a lot of people don't feel the same way, both because of the movie itself and from a lot of outside forces, which it kind of has put a pall over the movie, for sure, right? But when I think back to how much fun I had seeing it for the first time, feeling the same joy that I feel when I read a really good DC comic and how long has it been since that's happened, I had to put it on my list. I had a great time. I know a lot of outside forces have influenced how people feel about this film, and again, I get it, but I hope that people give it a chance down the line on digital and Max. Uh, and again, you might not like it, but like everyone I know liked it, uh, I, think that, I think the odds are solid enough that you can watch it at a low price point or for no extra cost. Uh, all right, number seven, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. Like a lot of people, I get this one. I'm on board with this one. I'm a bit marveled out. With all the movies and Disney Plus shows, it's just been a lot. And some of it, particularly, has not been very good, which has really taken a toll as well. And there seems to be no overall direction post-Endgame. But this was a fun movie and my favorite of the Guardians trilogy. To me, James Gunn is improving a lot as a writer-director, not just visually, but story-wise as well. Guardians of the Gal Galaxy Volume 3 is funny, thrilling, and also has some really dark but compelling sequences. Not everybody loves that, but I love that stuff. I love dark storytelling, and this was really good. And again, I think MCU fatigue is the only real reason this isn't higher up on my list. You're like, it was great, but what's the point? I'm glad uh, Chris Pratt's Star-Lord is sticking around, though, and I hope to see, I'm excited to see the new Guardians of the Galaxy team, hopefully soon, as well as the former members who have now struck out on their own. Thanks to Gunn's work over the trilogy and the Russos in Endgame, these have become some of my favorite MCU characters, uh, which really struck me when I was watching this film. I was like, I love you guys! I had to borrow a, a page from Groot. Number eight, 
Megan! Yeah, that's right. This movie came out this year, but at the very beginning of January. So I suspect a lot of people have forgotten about it already. But ah, when it came out, it was a sensation. I loved it. It was another pleasant surprise that I had such a good time seeing at the theater. Not only is Megan a clever commentary on technology today and how dependent we've become on it, it's becoming more, uh, more ripped from the headlines day by day. I can't wait to see what they do with the sequel. But it also perfectly captures modern social media culture. The Megan dance that Amy Donald and company came up with was an instant overnight sensation. It was so compelling. And styling Megan like an influencer was genius. I also think it's great to see women in the tech space recognized. That's great. From co-producer Allison Williams as Megan's inventor, perfectly cast. Allison Williams is slightly dislikable, but it was very well used here. She was phen phenomenal. And uh, up and coming screenwriter behind the camera, up and coming screenwriter, Akila Cooper. Uh, director Gerard Johnston also managed to strike just the right balance of horror and comedy. They don't do a ton of horror comedies these days. And uh, this was a great one. As I said, I can't wait for the sequel. Number nine, Elemental. I also liked this one. In fact, I think a lot of people like Elemental, or at least they will when it hits Disney Plus when I think most people are planning to watch it. Don't forget, it's so good. Elemental, I mean, it's number nine good, but it's good. Elemental is not just a charming story about an immigrant family trying to make a new home for themselves, but it's also surprisingly steamy romance, probably Pixar's most romantic movie to date. Uh, Leah Lewis and Mamadou Athi shine as Ember and Wade, and the movie is quite clever in what they can do as fire and water. It's almost like they're superheroes. I love that stuff. Sure, this is a very small film, but I think the real issue was that it was really poorly advertised. And it is, in fact, it wouldn't seem like it from the promotion, but it really is a worthy Pixar entry. And then finally, number 10, The Little Mermaid. I'm doing it. I'm putting it on here. This movie got so much hate and it really pulled its image down, which is so unfortunate. But again, I thought back to how much fun I had watching the film for the first time in theaters. And so I decided to put it here on my list. I still believe it's Disney's best live action adaptation to date. And while I understand, just like MCU fatigue, people are starting to experience Disney live action fatigue, well, on this one, I'm still enjoying them. Uh, the Little Mermaid, this one, is such a positive film and feels like a wonderful tropical vacation. Halle Bailey is a fantastic, charming Ariel, and I was dancing in my seat to the musical numbers and singing the famous songs for days after. Uh, Melissa McCarthy also makes for a great campy Ursula, and for the most part, the whole cast is fun. Uh, I also loved the visuals of the sea. I loved how they handled that, and I thought that infusing it with a Pirates of the Caribbean vibe was a really clever and effective idea. And I love the new ending. I mean, I just had a great time watching it, so I put it on my list. I mean, it's number 10. It probably won't make it to the end of the year, but I liked it, and I wanted to put it on here. So those are my top 10 movies of 2023 so far. What are yours? Share your lists and thoughts down below, subscribe, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.